Pink Floyd are arguably the most influential, progressive, psychedelic rock band of the 20th century. Pink Floyd were unique in their ability to combine melody and avant-garde sounds, and I think that's what kind of made them special. Putting it very simply, nobody sounded like them. The first incarnation of Pink Floyd met at London's Regent Street Polytechnic School in the early 1960s, a time when rock and roll exploded in popularity throughout the UK. It all kind of seems to come together when Roger Waters, Nick Mason and Richard Wright meet at London Polytechnic and they form a group called the T-Set. Pink Floyd really bonded, I think, over a love of 50s rock and roll. So they were really into acts like Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly as well. And when they started playing together, I think they started performing a lot of R&B standards as part of their setup. They all came of a generation where the first thing they got excited about on the radio was, you know, Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley. It's, everyone listened to the same thing, 1956, 57, and there'd never been anything like it. And more than anything else, you had the opportunity to make a band yourself. That's what galvanised not just Pink Floyd, but every British band of that era, because there was nothing else. There was no competing sounds. And the music was reasonably straightforward to play, the style of it, and that was ground zero. That's where they began. Art student Sid Barrett was introduced to the group and with his own songs he took over the frontman role and gave them the name of Pink Floyd, which was derived from the names of two blues musicians, Pink Anderson and Floyd Council. Most of them were architecture students, Sid Barrett was an art school student and they kind of came together and bonded over their love of blues music and uh, Sid Barrett from the off was kind of quite a character. I think Sid Barrett was a really interesting addition to the band. He'd been at art school and he was this kind of beautiful boy, very kind of charismatic performer and compelling to watch. And he also brought a kind of energy and a dynamism that Pink Floyd perhaps didn't have. Sid Barrett didn't see the world as other people. He was a, a genuine eccentric. And he was, of course, completely unsuited to anything resembling a high pressure pop star life. But he brought the quirkiness, he brought the un unusual individuality, which would make early Pink Floyd. As well as Sid's art school background, the Beatles proved an inspiration to the early stages of the band. There's remarkable albums that the Beatles did, the Abbey Road and the Sgt. Sod Pepper, etc. Then you can sense that that was a new world taking shape. The experimentation. The influence of the Beatles on all rock bands is sort of too big to be properly explained and that it wasn't just about melody and, and lyrics, it was about an attitude towards making albums. Suddenly records themselves became the focus rather than the sort of little three minute singles you're putting out. It had never been done before the Beatles and of course this was going to influence people like the young Sid Barrett, the young David Gilmour and everybody in Pink Floyd. They were playing lots of um, almost Velvet Underground type shows. They were in that world where they played book launches and, and art exhibitions and they had a light show and they played these underground clubs that were like the UFO that was run by um, Joe Boyd. They were known for playing kind of late night sets where they used to play in, in a club in Kensington and they used to play sort of three experimental sets all running at 90 minutes from kind of late evening to early morning um, and that was you know that was very radical at the time and quite a strange experience and a, a thing that a lot of people got very very excited about in London. In 1967 the band signed a deal with EMI and released their debut The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Their promotional single Arnold Lane was surprisingly banned from some radio stations for its lyrical content. Arnold Lane, it's ridiculous to think that was banned, but then this was the year of uh, the Rolling Stones not being allowed to sing Let's Spend the Night Together and have to change it to Let's Spend Some Time Together because it was seen as too risque. So it shows you just how long ago this was. I mean, Arnold Lane is a true story based on a, an old perv who used to nick knickers off Sid Barrett's mum's washing line in Cambridge, and it was just a sort of running joke. 
And there was a very 60s video of them running around on a beach with a male mannequin. Well, Arnold Lane is, is very much of its time, a slice of late 60s whimsy. It's about a transvestite knicker knicker. Um, it's a seaside postcard. It's a little bit bawdy, it's a little bit silly, and if you hear it, of course, it gives no indication as to what Lane store for Pink Floyd. It sounds like the one hit of a one hit wonder act. It really does. You never, hearing on Lane, you never expect to hear of Pink Floyd again. It's quite a standard kind of pop song, but there's bits of it, there's elements to it that are kind of freaky and that kind of are a little bit out there. And I think you can maybe hear the, the early R&B influences, but you can also see where the band were going to go with it. So it's this kind of interesting template for what was before and what they were about to become. Barrett's lyrics on the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, covering fairy tales and scarecrows pitted against the psychedelic instrumentation, tapped into the British consciousness and moved onto the charts. Lying on an Piper at the Gates of Dawn was the only album that the band actually did with Sid Barrett, and I think it's one of the standout records of the 60s, really. It's so innovative and pioneering. It's kind of taking all that kind of psych rock stuff and just really pushing that sound forward. The title is taken from a chapter in The Wind and the Willows, where Pan, the great god Pan, reveals himself. So all this kind of idea is, is filtering through this generation, tying in as well with the rise of LSD. Well, Sid Barrett is an, is an incredibly unique songwriter. If you take a song like a Bike or whatever, it's, it's on one level it's almost like a nursery rhyme, but there's this kind of unsettling strangeness to it, which, um, you know, was, was the thing that defined the early Pink Floyd. Barrett struggled with the success of the band, and whilst touring the US, it began to show. At the time, Barrett was using a lot of psychedelic drugs and I think eventually led to him having a mental breakdown. The strain was obviously really taking its toll on the band as well. He would turn up to interviews and not know where he was. He'd kind of be blabbering on in interviews. It got quite embarrassing, I think, for them. Um, on stage as well, he was just incredibly erratic. There are reports in the studio of him just asking them to play chords and, and playing completely different chords over the top and he was just becoming unreliable at gigs and they never knew what he was going to do and I think it just got to a point where they they kind of somewhat reluctantly just said that this this isn't going to work. The band began working on their follow-up album A Saucer Full of Secrets but started limiting Sid's involvement. With Saucer Full of Secrets you could see that Roger Waters was beginning to dominate Pink Floyd as he would for the next 10, 15 years. And the sound of Pink Floyd was beginning to take shape. So by the time of the second album, it wasn't that Barrett wasn't writing. He was at home writing songs. They just weren't being allowed on the record. And the one that he did get on the record, Jug Band Blues, says something like, I'm wondering who is writing this song. And it's a very, very naked portrayal of the schizophrenia that was developing. And the songs that they kept off that record that Roger Waters deemed too dark were things like Scream Thy Last Scream, which has a line, Scream Thy Last Scream, O Woman With A Casket. It's very, there's something very brave about it. They recruited the young Dave Gilmore too, and he added a sense of reliability, as well as some guitar playing, which was very much of its era. There was nothing whimsical about Dave Gilmore's guitar playing in the way that there was about Sid's guitar playing. And this essentially became the signature sound of Pink Floyd. With Sid gone and Dave Gilmore on board, the band ventured into new territory with experimental albums Umma Gumma, Atom Heart Mother and Metal. It really is the sound of the band, on one level, experimenting in these kind of great, kind of heroically long and quite fascinating jams, but also kind of this, this, this very English thing that's going on. Adam Hart Mother was Pink Floyd's first number one album, and I think that that record really cemented their 
reputation as kind of sonic adventurers, you know. Sid Barrett was out of the band, Dave Gilmore was fully in the band, and they were really experimenting a lot more with their recordings, and, you know, they weren't afraid to write these crazy sprawling songs that went on <laughs> forever. And that really kind of captured the zeitgeist at the time. As we now know, David Gilmore and Roger Waters agree about very little regarding Pink Floyd and Pink Floyd's history. One sentiment they do share is a disregard for Atom Heart Mother. They find it very, very difficult to listen to, both of them, for much the same reasons. And I think, to be honest, it's not a great Pink Floyd record by any means, but they are, they're a little harsh on it. <laughs> In 1973, Pink Floyd released The Dark Side of the Moon. It was to become their most critically and commercially successful album. It was amongst the first concept albums that ever emerged in rock music and it sold over 40 million records worldwide, which is just an astronomical number when you consider how many records are shifted these days. It was a rock album that was not about singles. It was about something that you took home and that you listened to in your room with two or three people in the dark or on your headphones. Um, and it encouraged a, a certain kind of patience and commitment to music which people really responded to very well at that time but it also had um, hits on it it had songs like money i love its jazziness i love the fact it's written in seven eight time and it sounds like something that cream could have come up with in the the late 60s it's actually quite a sort of retro sound it's simply timeless it didn't sound like anything else then it doesn't sound like anything else now and along the way it hasn't sounded like anything. It's completely on its own. For me, Comfortably Numb was probably my favorite Pink Floyd track. You can just kind of lose yourself in this crazy story of this guy Pink and his kind of weird lyrical interplay with the Doctor. I'm a sucker for those like crazy guitar solos as well in it. So I think Comfortably Numb for me is this perfect unhinged pop song. Come on, come on down. One of the things that Pink Floyd are are known for is the conceptual sleeves that um, were became a big part of what they did and it was all part of the package of presenting something as an album rather than just a collection of songs. Storm Thorgerson was the designer of Pink Floyd's most popular works. His sensibility was based around creating images to reflect the overall feel of an album and this meant not having members of the band on the sleeve, the prism for Dark Side of the Moon, or that extraordinary picture of Wish You Were Here with a man shaking hands with a flame suit on. And this spoke in a sense of alienation and Roger Waters' lyrical concerns, but you could make of them what you will. The only certainty about these sleeves is that they were anti-pop. For Atom Heart Mother, you recognise the cow, you don't even need to see the name Pink Floyd because it's not on there. And nowadays it's funny because those things are actually selling, still selling like hotcakes in um, what's left of the record stores that people will buy t-shirts with that prism on it because it's recognisable from 30 feet away across the street and it's not, it's not even about listening to the music. So they did have quite an unusual place in the, that sense of um, how carefully they marketed themselves while still being political band in a funny kind of way. Roger Waters took control again for the 1979 album The Wall. Its success led to the production of a huge worldwide tour and a film based on its concept directed by Alan Parker. But behind the wall, things were troubled for Waters. I think The Wall was uh, economically and commercially a high point for the band, but psychologically very very dark one i mean it came out of um absolute contempt for fame and for the audience they, i mean just before he started writing the war concept he famously spat at an audience member who was irritating him in the front row and they were quite brave in exploring the idea of that barrier between the audience and, and them which is where this idea came from about literally building a wall between you Come to the 
for all the, the, the good things that Dave Gilmore and Richard Wright and even Nick Mason did on this album, this is Roger Waters' vision. And it's so unusual because of the way that it tackles that most indulgent of subjects, being a pop star and fame, in the way that it does. The lead single, Another Brick in the Wall, part two, was promoted with a video featuring animation by Gerald Scar. Its disco beat saw it become their biggest single to date. Another Brick in the Wall, part two, is definitely the most well-known Pink Floyd single for good reason. It's a bit of a tour de force in terms of the, the choir on there and the arrangement. Um, it's quite pop, but quite strange as well. It also had this chorus of children, and it was all about kids at school, so it was appropriate they got this group of kids from Islington School to, to sing this chorus, and it's, it's one of their poppiest songs, and it's also one of their coolest songs. Roger Waters' last album with Pink Floyd would be the final cut. It was planned to be a soundtrack to the film The Wall, but became a collection of songs rallying against the Falklands War. If we're looking at great Pink Floyd singles, I'd go for Not Now John off the final cut, which is incredibly intense. It's incredibly barbed rant against Thatcherism, but it's so exciting and it, it has drills on it. Waters gone, Dave Gilmore was now in charge of the direction of the band, and two more albums were produced, A Momentary Lapse of Reason and The Division Bell. I all thought that the split brought out the best in both Gilmore and Waters. Learning to fly was as beautiful as Pink Floyd have ever been. Likewise, High Hopes and Keep Talking. Gilmore was honest enough to understand that he didn't care about lyrics. He's a music man. For him, lyrics are of, of little interest, in a way that I think they, they are to, to very few people in bands. The Sid Barrett phase is perhaps most favourite amongst musicians just because it's so um, unique. And then the Roger Waters phase is, you know, there's some incredible music, but it became defined by the level of success and just how huge it all became. The Gilmore era, while not quite scaling the heights of their mid-70s successes, um, is still very profitable for them. a lot of time for Dave Gilmore because he's a serious musician and a lot of people believe that he was very important in translating Roger Waters' ideas into records. You know, Roger Waters had the concept and Gilmore was helped make them into music. Um, but I think that those two last albums of theirs, they do miss that sense of a sort of overarching, cohesive, political, pseudo-political theme um, that Roger Waters was so good at. After a break following the release of 1994's The Division Bell, the band reformed with Roger Waters in 2005 for the global charity event Live 8. When Waters and Gilmore reunited in 2005, it was a really emotional performance, I think, for them. They kind of all have this really kind of big group hug at the end, and it just, you can feel the emotion in the air. I was quite touched that they dedicated Wished You Were Here to. Sid Barrett. I mean, that's 30 years ago, and they're still dedicating a song to him on stage, which does suggest that the, the memory of that episode in their history has been absolutely integral to everything that came afterwards. And they've always, I think they've, they've always admitted that Sid Barrett was the creative force and they had to create something in that vacuum. Um, and I thought it was quite touching. He was still alive then. It wasn't a, a tribute to him having passed away. He was probably watching it on TV in Cambridge, and that's quite an emotional moment. The grass was greener. The light was brighter. 
With their incredibly innovative sound and revolutionary live shows, Pink Floyd remain one of the most influential groups in popular music. To trace Pink Floyd's DNA in the current pop landscape is, <laughs> is quite a task. But you know, you, you can see their influence in bands like Radiohead, even in bands like Nine Inch Nails, The Smashing Pumpkins, in ambient electronic music. And any band that kind of really utilizes echoes and layers, and they just are an incredibly influential band. There's a clear influence with a with a record like OK Computer. There are there are moments on that that are just so you know that's so obviously indebted to Pink Floyd. The fact that they took it into into the mainstreams and you know that they got it into kind of just everyday households. How they presented themselves was also a remarkable feat of understanding the logistics of pop music, which is meant to be about celebrity, it's meant to be about individuals. Pink Floyd didn't do that. They were completely anti-personality. They didn't put their pictures on their albums, and these albums still sold phenomenal amounts, even when records were selling. So therefore it showed that you didn't have to play the game in that way. And to show that you can be anti-pop and be one of the, the biggest selling bands of all time is a remarkable achievement. And you hear their legacy everywhere. Whenever a band sells a lot of records and doesn't compromise, then they're taking from the Pink Floyd template. Oh, I enjoyed that. And more musical originality and genius in the form of Frank Zappa. Does humour belong in music? It clearly does. Tomorrow night at 10.30.